So don't be scared. It's actually part of the plan. And uh, it is normal behavior, kind of. So before we get started quickly, we'll just do a quick acknowledgement uh, uh, that the city of Pickering resides on the land within the jurisdiction of the Williams Trees and on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nations. The Anishinaabek and the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. This acknowledgement reminds us of our responsibilities to our relationships and the ancestral lands on which we learn, share, and live in the city of Pickering. We're just going to try and settle ourselves down a little bit here before we sing some more with a call to worship designed to point us upward. Uh, later on during the sermon, that might change and it might be pointed inward. But right now, it's pointed upward and outward. The call to worship is based on Isaiah 44 and uh, is responsive. And what you need to know is the phrase, there is no one like our God exclamation mark that's where you come in come and worship all you who love and serve the Lord there is no one like our God. that's a good start the first and last the only one there is no one like our God. creator sustainer redeemer and king there is no one like our God. the rock in whom we place our trust Our God never changes. God is constant. There is no one like our God. Let us worship God together. Uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, business announcements and stuff, get that out of the way before we do some more fun stuff. Um, there is an announcement. Uh, is Lori in the house today? No, not Lori. You're not Lori, but no, you're not. <laughs> Just well, this one is about the, the bazaar coming up for those people that are planning and, and bringing and selling and being part of it. Uh, November the 12th is the date to mark on your calendar for the Christmas bazaar. Um, and uh, for anybody who knows someone who might be looking for these particular skill set jobs, we have advertisements out for a youth leader and for an office person. Uh, if you know someone that might be interested in that, uh, I think Indeed is the place to go for Amberly to find that. Um, thank you for everybody who continues to contribute and help us with the money part of making this church happen. Uh, there are many multiple ways to do it. We'll have an offering here today. There's online services. There's uh, PAR, which is a, an automatic deduction thing. There's anything that you're interested in. If you wish to, online with Amberly.ca, there are choices to be made there. And... Um, there's a 40th anniversary celebration cooking for next year. Uh, I think there has been a committee meeting at least once to discuss those things. We'll have more information about how you might want to participate if you wish with that. A uh, couple other shorties. Uh, I'll ask Caroline to come up right now uh, to discuss something that we will call is uh, uh, an event. A big event. So. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mona, <laughs> for those of you that don't know, this is actually Mona's 10 years of being at Amberley. <laughs> and so, Mona, <laughs> we love you, and we are just so deeply grateful for everything you've done for us as a church. You inspire us with your amazing sermons, where each of us, I'm sure, can say that we hear the word of God and actually know how to apply it in our everyday lives, which is not always true for many other churches. Um, and above all, you are amazing, wonderful woman who has transformed the lives, I'm sure, I know of Ella and I, but I'm sure of many others here. Thank you. From the deepest bottom of all of our hearts, thank you. So that's not the only exciting thing that's happening in the ministry in our area. We're going from 10 years to a brand new beginning. Yeah. 
So this afternoon at uh, Wexford Presbyterian Church in Scarborough, which is on Lawrence Avenue, just west of Warden Avenue, there's going to be an induction service with uh, someone who's been with us, who's preached to us, who's uh, also been an inspiration and brought the word to us in amazing ways, Sandra Mashingazy. And she is going to be inducted this afternoon approximately around 3.30 at Wexford. So, so if there are anybody, is there anybody here in the congregation, if you need directions, Mona or I can help you with that. If you would like to go there, you can participate as an audience member and support her. Uh, I'm just going to ask her to come up real quick for a minute, just to say a quick something. All right. Good morning to you all. Good morning. Oh, I didn't even know. We'll just, we'll just use this one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That one's not turned on. Just go ahead. Okay. All right. Good morning to you all. I didn't even know that it was going to be Reverend Mona's big thank you. So God does what God does. <laughs> and I'm so humbled this morning to come before you this morning, I felt that if I don't come before you and stand before you and say thank you, I wouldn't start my ministry right. So with all humility, I want to say to the congregation of uh, Emberley, thank you. You are an amazing congregation. And I wanted to say to all the elders that work tirelessly for Emberley, thank you. You do a good job. And I know that Reverend Mona is surrounded by good people. And above all, I want to say to Reverend Mona, I love you with all of my heart. You always, I always carry a piece of you in my heart and my family. Reverend Mona loved me when no one else loved me. I don't know what Reverend Mona means to you, but all I'm asking you this morning is to continue to pray for Reverend Mona. She is a woman who loves God with all of her heart. You have a good minister. Pray for your husband, pray for your kids, and support her. I love you, Reverend Mona. I love you so, so much. And thank you to the congregation of Amberley. I will always be here anyway. We'll be taking turns with Mona. Sometimes I'll be here, sometimes she'll go to Wexford. So thank you so, so much for all your love and support. God bless. All right, so the, the Presbyterian world is a relatively small one, so we know each other, we support each other, and uh, we always are trying to look out for each other, and, uh, and uh, we're excited that Sandra's going to take on this new challenge, and uh, as a younger man, I was actually at Wexford myself, so uh, I'm, I'm excited that she's going to go there and bring... Well, it's hard to picture... <laughs> It's hard, it's, it's really hard to, like, if you had a computer thing, you could do a, one of those, one of those, uh, you know, missing children thing where they, you know. anyway, we're going to keep moving on because I think that's it for announcements and we're going to sing some more stuff. So we're going to hear the word in a few minutes, but before we do that, we've got some more work to do. Uh, we've started tuning up our hearts a little bit tonight, to this morning, and uh, we just need a little bit more work to do before we're ready. So we're going to pray, we're going to talk to God as individuals and, as, and corporately as a congregation. At, at a point, I'm going to stop because if there is someone who would like to bring forward a name that's on their hearts, just first name, no story. Uh, we'll provide the space for that, and you can just bring them to God as an as a open prayer, and uh, we'll continue on after a bit. And then we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, if you're not familiar with that one, it's going to be displayed on the screen. So let's get started and uh, talk to God. Lord, we're privileged to be in your presence today. We're privileged to be together as fellow believers, as congregants, as faithful followers of you and your disciples. 
we do not understand the privilege fully. But we understand that we are taught that you are a God of love unconditionally. It's a part that we struggle with every day. How we treat other people, how we treat ourselves, how we view other people, how we view ourselves. But you are that firm foundation that we can build our faith upon because you are a loving God deserving of trust. Our trust falters when we see the news. Our trust falters when we hear the stories. Our trust falters when we see things happening between people every day. It's not nice. Sometimes it's ugly. And that shows us what we can truly be if we let that darkness take over us. So we know that we need to build our trust with you because you are there for us. We have to reach up as you are already reaching down. We know from your word, from the sermons that were taught, that you are a faithful God who wants us to succeed. You know it's a struggle here. We are earthly beings. We have our problems. We have our struggles. We have our fears. We have our anxieties generated within our families, generated within our communities, generated within the world as it stands because we don't know how to treat each other properly. We ask, us, ask you to fill us with understanding to the point where we can move forward with our lives that you have a plan for, that you know where we can go. You know where we can develop fully as followers of Jesus, as faithful followers of you. We ask you to be with us now as we receive a word that's important, a word that has been honed and crafted, a word that's going to resonate as we sit in the seats. We ask that you help us carry that word forward out of these doors into the community, that we would be your love in this world that so desperately needs it. We have people that are on our hearts specifically, Lord, people in our families, people in our neighborhood, people in this congregation. We're thankful for all the blessings and the privileges that we have here in this place, in this country, aware that so many people don't have even the basic things that we do. But we do want to petition you, Lord, as our own hearts move us, to bring a name forward, especially as you know the circumstances, but we know that you will listen to us, Lord, and so we bring those names to you now. Lord, we know that you hear us in each and every circumstance, that we're humbled by our inadequacies to express ourselves both in faith and in word, but we're counting on you to fill in the gaps for us. So we ask you to hear us, to give us the peace and understanding that trust builds that you are in that situation wherever it might be in health, in spirit, in conflict, in family. And that we can trust you to move in, in the way that you need it to do as best, according to your plan. And so we come to you now, and we speak the words that Jesus taught us in the New Testament. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning. 
was actually a little bit embarrassing. I thought I was at my own funeral for a second. Yeah, jeepers. Good morning, and welcome to those of you who are here with us. woo And those of you who are joining us online, we are so glad that you tuned in today. Um, I just wanted to say up front that last week I shared with you about my fine china and how I've had it for 35 years and never once used it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to our YouTube page and and watch the sermon. Um, But um, I told you that there were instances where, you know, my fine china is... We were talking about God being holy, and I was giving a very bad analogy, but that my, my ch- fine china is high and lifted up. <laughs> it's, an, you know, it's really, really special, and that I was known and have been known in the past to set the di- dining table with the beautiful fine china, and then just before the meal was served, I took it all away, and we all ate on the everyday <laughs> plates like I've done that. So um, I was so convicted by the looks you gave me and by my own preaching, that on Thanksgiving Sunday, I'll have you know, I dug out our fine china and we ate off of it for Thanksgiving dinner, right? Thank you so much. Yes, yes, I just wanted to tell you that. I also wanted to tell you that I said to the kids, I said, I don't even care, just throw it in the dishwasher. To which Emily responded, Mom, that is just crazy talk. So they, they washed it by hand and they put it away. That was pretty good. So I wanted you to know that. I wanted you to know that your intervention worked, that preaching worked, and my mindset was changed. Change. Change. Is it me, or have you noticed that things just keep on changing? Have you noticed that? It's not just me, right? I mean, it's not just the world. I mean, I'm thinking about my own life, right, where uh, it feels like yesterday that I had little ones underfoot, right? And now... Uh, yeah, I'd give anything for them to just kind of come and make a mess and, and, and that beautiful chaos that they create. Um, and I, now, I, like, my house is empty. It's quiet. I mean, there's Brian. But my house is quiet. <laughs> and, and we're eating a fine china. Like, things are changing, people. Things are changing, right? Um, and though I may look 39 to you, <laughs> that was a little louder than I had wanted. <laughs> um, I'm aging fast. I mean, really, really fast. My eyesight is going. You would be, you would be shocked by the size of my font on this page, (laughs) right? It's frustrating. It can get frustrating. And sometimes all of those changes, certainly in my own life, can cause me to feel unsettled. I don't know if that's something you can relate to. And if you do, if you find yourself a little bit frustrated with yourself or with the situation that you're facing, we're going to talk today about a guy in Psalm 102 uh, who was also struggling. But before we do that, let's just go to God's, just let's, before we go to God's word, let's, let's pray. Father, we ask today that in your presence with so many people that are hurting and anxious, that the truth of your inspired word would move us to trust in you in a way that builds our faith and makes us more like Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Psalm 102, and you may wonder, well, who wrote Psalm 102? And the answer is we're not exactly sure. Some theologians think it's David during the time of Absalom's rebellion. Uh, Others think it's a prophet who was just hurting in a time of captivity. We don't know who it was, but what we do know is that this guy was having a very difficult season. And in verse 1, he cries out to God. Listen to what he says. Hear my prayer, O God. Let my cry for help come to you. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like you're crying out to God? Just listen, just listen. Then he goes on in verse 2 and 4. Do not hide your face from me when I'm in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer quickly, for my days vanish like smoke. My bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. And I forget to eat my food. You know it's bad when... You forget to eat your food, right? This guy is in distress. I mean, he's, he's feeling hopeless. He, he can't eat. He can't sleep. He's spiritually and relationally isolated. And I'm not an expert, but he sounds kind of depressed. His world is unsettled. There's nothing he can count on. Everything around him is changing. 
and you can't keep up with it. Not unlike our world today, right? Everything's changing at an unstoppable, uncontrollable pace. Rules change. Policies change. What's appropriate to say and not say changes, right? Government leaders change. The gas prices probably since the time I started preaching has changed, right? The weather changes, the music changes, fashion changes. Everything around us is changing, and it feels so unsettling and uncertain. What can you count on in this incredibly uncertain world? When people let you down, when your finances just don't seem like there's just, it's not enough. When you, when you look at the world and the news and you think, how could this world get, get any worse? What, what can you count on when everything is uncertain? Well, we're in a message series. We're actually in part five of a message series called God Is. And we're talking about the attributes of God. And the attribute of God that I want to talk about today is what theologians will call the immutability of God, which is another way of saying that God is constant and unchanging. God doesn't change When everything else around us changes, you can put your faith in God who never, who never changes. The psalmist feels a lot like many of us might feel right now, right? He's anxious. He's unsettled. Your world might feel like, you know, how am I going to pay my bills or afford to buy a house or, you know, how am I going to afford to put gas in my car? You know, my marriage or my relationships with my kids, not the way I want it to be. This guy is in a similar place, unsettled. And the same guy who cries out, God, are you even listening to my prayer? Declares in verses 25 to 26. Listen to this. In the beginning, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, meaning they'll go away. It won't be the same. They will perish, but you, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them and they will be discarded. But you remain the same and your years will ever end. We serve a God who is consistent. A God who never, never changes. Malachi 3 verse 6, God says this, I, the Lord, do not change. And the author of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean to us? What does it mean? What it means is there is never a time when God was not God. God is the first and the last. God is the beginning and the end. God always has been. God always will be. God is holy. God is perfect. God is without blemish. And because God is perfect, God can't get any better because if God could get better, then God would have been incomplete before. You with me? And because God is perfect, God can't get any worse because then God would have been imperfect if God did. God is God and God is holy, holy, holy. And there is no other like God. God says, I am the Lord. I do not change. Now, the very first time I heard this, I was a new Christian. I was in my 20s, and I started to think about this immutability of God, and I must admit, I found it rather confusing. And I started to ask questions. Like, if God doesn't change, then does God change his mind? Can God's mind change? And then this complex question came to my mind. Well, if God doesn't change, if God can't change, then why should I pray? And so let's talk about that a little bit. Let's look at some different scriptures to answer the question. If God never changes, can God change his mind? Numbers 23, verse 19. Scripture says this. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Okay, well, it's in the Bible then, right? It's very, very clear, very direct that can God change his mind? It says, 
very obviously here in Scripture, no, no, God can't change his mind, doesn't change his mind. And so, there. Let's look at another Scripture, Exodus 32, where God told Moses, yo, Mo, you better go check your people because while you were out busy doing something else, they, your people, the, the people, went out and built these golden calves, right? And now they're no longer worshiping me. They're worshiping these golden calves. I'm not keen on that. It's not cool. Uh, I'm going to destroy them. And Mo, Moses says, no, God, please, no, you can't do that. They, they made a mistake. Be, uh, uh, let me fix it, God. Let me, let me fix it. Please forgive them. Don't destroy them. Don't do this. Exodus 32, verse 14, Scripture says, Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Can you believe I'm even highlighting this in church? Like, this is, they're, they're polar opposites, aren't they? Right? They're polar opposites. It's very confusing. If God doesn't change, can God change his mind? And the Bible says God can't, and the Bible says God can Ah! So, you know, it, it, it's confusing. It's very confusing. And that's unsettling for me. I don't know about you, but it's very complex, and it's unsettling. But this is a serious question. And any time you find yourself with a question in Scripture, we have to remember that there are some very simple rules. Number one, listen to this. We always have to look at the broader context. So when you have one, thing, one passage saying this, another passage saying this, you have to look at the broader context, not just the verse, but you have to look at who's writing it, to whom is it written, when was it written, what is the local context. And the other thing we have to do, we always have to interpret the Bible in light of the Bible. We're looking at the big themes. We're looking at consistency, Okay. And so what we have here is a complicated theological issue. Very sincere believers differ on how they view this. So let me tell you the two sides and what most people believe, okay? There's one side called open theist, okay? And, and, and they take the second verse literally. An open theist would say that it's, you know, that God's plans are, are, are not fixed that God can indeed change God's mind. Okay. There's another concept that's called anthropomorphism. And anthropomorphism is when someone is attributing human characteristics to something or someone. Okay, now you're looking at me funny, so let me give you an example. It's like Kung Fu Panda, right? Kung Fu Panda does Kung Fu and talks. The problem is... Pandas do not talk or do kung fu. <laughs> not the ones at the zoo. They don't, right? This is a very common thing. These are human qualities that are being put upon something that is not human. Uh, it's so common in scripture when, we ref when writers refer to God. Why? Because people are talking about God from their own knowledge, and we have knowledge of humans, Right? And so when you read that God is a spirit, well, we know God is spirit. Spirits don't have legs. But you read in Genesis that the God walked in the garden among them. That's anthropomorphism, attributing human qualities to God. So what do we have? We have God, God says, I got to punish them because they are worshiping these golden calves. I've got to punish them. And Moses begs God not to. And Moses is telling the story from his point of view, from his angle, looking at God um, th that he cannot completely understand or comprehend, right? He says God changed his mind. That's what, that's what Moses says, God changed his mind. But we could argue that Moses didn't know that God already knew that God was going to show mercy, that God wanted Moses to ask for mercy. And when Moses asked for mercy, God didn't change God's character. God was consistent in character, which is to show mercy, which is to show grace, which is to show compassion. 
There wasn't a change in God's character. It was a response to the action of God's people. And that's what most people would believe, that we attribute human qualities to God, and that's how Moses saw it. So if God doesn't change his mind, uh, then it brings up another question. Why am I spending so much time praying? Why, I, you know, I'm praying for, for people to be healed. I, I am praying for provision. I am praying for a miracle. I'm praying for people that are far away from God would, would actually come closer to God. Why would I pray if God doesn't change his mind? Well, it's complicated, right? What does scripture say? James 4 verse 2 says this. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. God wants us to ask. And if we ask, God will do what we ask God to do unless God doesn't. 1 John 5, verse 14 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Again, I'm confused. Which one is true? Does God give us what we ask for? Or does God give us what we ask according to God's will? And the answer is both. God does indeed respond to our prayers. But God loves us so much that God will never give us something outside of God's will. So what is the purpose of prayer? It's not just to get what we want. The purpose of prayer is not just to get God to do our will. The purpose of prayer is for us to know God so that we can do God's will. So what does prayer do? God wanted Moses to ask. God wanted Moses in a relationship, and God wants us in a relationship. God wants us to need God, and God wants us to know that we need God. Listen, I love, I love my kids, and I love, the, I love it when they need something from me. I really, really do, because I love them, and I want to bless them right? And I love it when they ask and I can provide because I love my children. So what does prayer do? Prayer reminds us that we are not in control and it keeps us close to the one who is. We serve a God who is so good. God does not change. Now, what does this mean for us? Because we have some real issues, right? Some of us have teenagers that are making us pray. Amen? Right? Or children. <laughs> uh, uh, we're worried about the economy. Uh, you've got people in your life that have told you one thing and then gone ahead and done something completely different because people, unfortunately, will let us down. Some of you are dealing with massive financial stress right now. You've got credit cards that are maxed out. Inflation is climbing, and the world just seems to be in turmoil. And spoiler alert, your body is aging. I, I don't care what supplements you take. The sag is coming, friends. <laughs> right? You do the diet thing, your body goes back, and then it hits the ground. I mean, it's changing. It's changing. Some of you are way too young to notice, uh, but a day will come when the font of your, of your papers get bigger and bigger, and, and you'll have to have a bio break in the middle of a movie, right? It, it's coming, I'm telling you. What, what, what do we do when the world is constantly changing? What do we do when we can't count on anything? We choose to count on a God who never changes. And I want to show you from God's word two qualities of the immutability of God uh, that matter to you every moment of the day if you have faith to see it. The first thing is that God's word never changes. God's word never changes. The word of God is living and it's active and it's powerful and it's sharper than a double-edged sword. The word never 
returns void. God's word never changes. Scripture says in Isaiah 48, the grass withers and the flowers fail and fall, but the word of God endures forever. Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never, ever pass away. What do we do? What do we know about the living word of God? Well, we know that the word, the word is fixed. It's enduring. It's lasting. It's true. It's irrevocable. It's, it's indestructible. The word of God is living. It's powerful. I'm telling you, if you read the word of God, you'll read, it'll change you. You go ahead and you read it one day, you read it the next day, and you are going to see something completely different. It is alive. It's living. It's powerful. It transforms you. It gives you hope. The word of God never changes. The second thing is this. God's character never changes. God didn't have to do a study to be wise because God is wisdom. God didn't have to receive love in order to know how to give love because God is love. God didn't see, you know, didn't have to see mercy to show mercy. Why? Because God's mercy is everlasting. God's character never, ever changes. God is always with you. God will never forsake you. And that's why Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all of these things. So whatever you're facing, beloveds, whatever you're facing, whatever comes up against you, whatever hurt or hurdle or opposition that you face today, we, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And then he goes on to say, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. Our God is always good. God cannot not be good. God is always loving. God cannot not be loving. God is holy and God is just and God is righteous and God is always patient and God is always full of compassion. And that's why God says, I am God. There is no other. I am God and there is no other like me. So when you're worried about someone and you don't know how to reach them, you don't know how to care for them, when you have a problem with a, with a child or your marriage feels like there's, just, there's no hope, when you have ongoing financial stress, when you look at the global events and it makes you unsettled and worried and you're thinking, how are my kids going to grow up in this or my future children grow up in this? This deteriorating moment by moment, day by day, week by week, month by month, worry. You remember that God's word never changes. God's character never changes. And here is the good news. God's promises never change. We've all had someone in our lives break a promise. It's devastating, isn't it? When you think that someone is going to have integrity, but they don't. You think that someone's going to tell the truth to you, but they don't. You think that someone's always going to be with you, and they don't. It's devastating that people are fickle, right? People will fail you, but God is always faithful. God is always faithful. Okay, random question. How many of you like gift cards? Anybody like gift cards? You like gift cards? Do you like gift cards, sir? Do you like gift cards? Okay, well, I just, I just happen to have... Pardon me? Oh, it's not your first shirt? Well, too bad. You're going to get one anyway. <laughs> Here, do you like Starbucks or Tim Hortons? It's enough for a coffee, so... Uh, you don't know how to do that? Do you like gift cards, sir? There you go. Welcome to Amber Lee. This is how we buy new people. and <laughs> okay, Encourage them to come back. All right. Okay, so gift cards. Gift cards. Um, I read an article, listen to this, hang on to that, put, put it in your pocket, but not for too long. I read an article online that said, because um, <laughs> everything on the internet is true, right? Um, I read this article that said that $15.5 billion 
are left on unused gift cards. That's a lot of money, right? On unused gift Some of you right now are thinking, gee, I think I have like $7.25 left on a Swiss chalet gift card, right? You've, you've probably got a gift card. I'm guessing right now, for those of you who received a gift card, you know you have a gift card, but there's probably, all of us have a gift card somewhere, right, that is unused, that not redeemed, waiting for you to get what that card promised you could have, and you haven't gotten it yet because you haven't applied what's on the card to get the value out of the gift that somebody wanted you to have. And I would say the very same thing many times over. There would be thousands upon thousands of unclaimed promises from God that God has promised his people waiting in heavenly places. God has paid the price. God has blessed you with the gift. And yet, perhaps you haven't received the promise that God has for you. Just perhaps. What if the promise of God, what, what, what are they? Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1.20, he said, no matter what, no, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. Whatever promise God has in God's word, it applies to you. God blesses you. You are in Christ. You, you are God's child. God loves you. You are God's very own. You can redeem that card. God's word applies to you every moment. And God's promises, whichever one you need, is always true for you. It's yes and amen. Honestly, people, it's time to redeem those gift cards, right? And it's, and it's time to redeem God's promises in a world where nothing is constant, right? Nothing is constant. Hold on to the one that is always constant, the one who never changes and is always, always trustworthy. Amen? Let's pray. So, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would do a work in your people. Father, we pray for those of us who are feeling unsettled. We thank you that you are a constant, that you are always good, that you're always faithful, that you're always a God of mercy. And, God, we thank you that you are always available to us. We thank you that you didn't wait for us to seek you, but you showed your love to us in Jesus. Lord, we put our trust in you. We cast our cares upon you. In a world that is always uncertain, we cling to your word. We believe in your character, and we claim your promises to be true. God, help us to find peace in you today and every day. We're grateful that we can say that God is constant. We pray these things in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So this is the part of the service where we're going to